I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. (laughs) Alleluia. He is indeed. Do have a seat. Let me add my welcome to Simon's. Uh, in case uh, you don't know me, I'm Gemma. I'm the vicar here at St. Mary's. It's great to have you all with us at home and here in the building. Let's pray. Loving Lord Jesus, we thank you for your risen life and thank you for the way that you invite us to be part of that risen life. And so now, would you open our ears and our hearts that we might hear from you what you want to say to each of us? this morning and to us collectively as the body of Christ here in this place. Amen. Let me begin with a quick straw poll. Um, Put your hand up if you would say that you were a deep sleeper. Um, Some people, Simon is, yeah, I think, I know it's a spectrum and I know it depends on the kind of the, you know, the circumstances and stuff, but yeah, a few of you are going to admit to being a deep sleeper. Great. I'm assuming the rest of you would say that you probably were a more kind of shallow sleeper. Um, When I was a child, uh, my whole family and I slept through a major gas leak that happened outside our row of terrace cottages. Uh, We had the fire service and the police there, complete with sirens, uh, and we knew nothing of it until the next morning when we heard the news from our neighbours. If you uh, search the internet through the many blogs that backpackers write, Apparently, it is even possible to sleep through major earthquakes. One young traveller claimed that they had slept through a 7.1 on the Richter scale earthquake in Guatemala. I mean, yeah, the mind boggles, but I mean, that really is a deep sleep. The eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that in Matthew's account of the resurrection of Jesus, there is an earthquake. In fact, actually, if we were to read um, back in chapter 27, he mentions the second earthquake, one which took place on Good Friday at the moment of Jesus's death. And then this other on Sunday morning, just before the angel rolled away the stone from in front of the tomb. Even those of us who will have heard plenty of Easter Day sermons 
might not have spotted these references to earthquakes or pondered on them very much because often on Easter Sunday morning we hear the wonderful account from John's gospel um, where Jesus has that amazing dialogue with Mary who mistakes him for the gardener. But I think it's great that we can read Matthew's account today and we get the different details of that same amazing event recorded for us. And certainly Matthew is one to emphasize the drama of it. He reminds us that it was dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to the tomb. As they arrive, there's this violent earthquake and an angel shining with a dazzling brightness descends from heaven, rolls back the stone and sits on top of it. I love this next detail that he gives us. He says, the guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. I think if we were writing it, we'd probably say they shook and fainted. Then the angel speaks to the women and says to them, Jesus is alive and heading for Galilee. And they have a quick look in the tomb to see for themselves. And then they dash off to tell the rest of the disciples. But as they're hurrying away, Jesus appears to the women and they fall at his feet in awe and worship. And then he too urges them to go and tell the others the good news. And so it's easy as we get swept up into the excitement and the drama of the resurrection account that we miss that detail about the earthquakes. But what those earthquakes I think hint at is that Jesus's resurrection doesn't only affect people, it is a world-shaking event. Jesus is dying and rising again affects actually the whole of creation. And at Easter, we celebrate something which is world-changing, universe-changing, cosmos-changing. The resurrection doesn't just impact me and you. The resurrection changed everything. We know because we've seen pictures and some of us might have encountered them for ourselves, but major earthquakes rip through the very fabric of the world beneath our feet and huge structures topple to the ground and often the landscape is changed completely. The resurrection of Jesus does those things but with even greater impact to the very fabric of the world itself. And yet so many of us have slept right through it. And I wonder whether or not our kind of sleepy response to the resurrection is because we don't actually always reflect on what it means when we say that Easter is a new beginning or the start of a new life. It's lovely that we get to have chocolate eggs at Easter and that we were reminded uh, that uh, new life comes out of eggs. But what do we actually mean in a biblical sense when we talk about new life at Easter time? One of the key messages that goes through the whole of the Bible is that in the end, God is going to do for the whole of creation what he did for Jesus at Easter. He's going to take the physical reality which has been broken and smashed beyond belief and he will rescue and restore it so that it's not just in the same state as it was before but it's actually renewed and will forever be alive no longer subject anymore to death or decay this isn't easy for us to get our heads around because we're hardwired to believe that everything is broken and that in the end, everything will eventually die. But God promises to one day usher in an indestructible physical reality that the Bible calls the new creation, or sometimes it calls it the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the new life that we're heading for. And it's a universe shaking event on the grandest of scales. When he rose from the dead and emerged from the tomb on Easter morning, Jesus becomes the first ever 
truly resurrected person. His body was no longer subject to decay because he had passed through death. In Greek, the word resurrection is anastasis. It literally means a standing up. And it speaks of something very, very physical. Resurrection happens to bodies and to things. It's not about our spirit going up to heaven. In the Bible, we read about a small number of people who Jesus raised from the dead. There was Lazarus, there was Jairus' daughter and one of them. But these people still went on to die eventually in the same way that we all one day will. But the hope-filled, joyful message of the Bible is that those who believe in Jesus will fully share in his resurrection. And so that means we are looking forward to a physical life in the new and resurrected new creation or the new heavens and the new earth. And we will enjoy that place as material beings whose bodies have been remade and are ready to live forever. When I was um, a teenager, I used to imagine heaven being this place where our spirits went. And for some reason, and I really don't know why this was, but I pictured everybody's spirit as looking like a little cube of sugar um, with a little smiley face on it. Um, I really don't know why I thought that, because I'm sure that nobody had ever told me that that's what heaven was like. It's, often, it's very strange how we come to conclusions about things without quite knowing how we got there. But gradually, over the next few years, as I read more and more of the Bible and I dug into what it actually teaches us, I discovered that that kind of sugar cube view of life but on death was wholly inaccurate. Throughout um, this term, since January, those of us who come regularly to St Mary's have been exploring Revelation together, the last book of the Bible, which points us toward what we can expect when Jesus comes again. And what we've discovered is that we shouldn't be expecting to disappear up to heaven and spend eternity with God on some kind of ethereal cloud. But rather, we should be eagerly expecting the dawn of the new creation, which will come from God and will be the place where God will fully dwell once again with humanity. So the new creation is not about us being taken away to a different sort of place, but about Jesus coming back to transform completely and utterly this present world into the place that he wants it to be and to transform us completely and utterly into the people that he wants us to be. And in ways that start to kind of stretch my mind to the limits of what it can cope with, the Bible teaches us that on that first Easter morning, the new creation came into being through the resurrected body of Jesus. All of the gospel writers are keen to emphasize that the resurrection happened at dawn on the first day of the week. And that is a phrase which should take our minds back to the beginning of the Bible and the creation story in Genesis. Here now at Easter, we have a new creation narrative. Jesus's body points us towards what will one day be true in a much bigger sense. Creation will be resurrected and made perfect again. Quite how that will work out in practice, <laughs> we can't be sure. Um, but I'm confident that the end result is going to be beyond our wildest imaginings. One way that I just find it helpful to imagine it is to use an example that we find in the natural world. So this will be something that all of you, um, however young or old you are, will know about. So caterpillars undergo the process that's called metamorphosis. And when they go into their cocoon stage, what is actually happening inside the cocoon is that their body, the body of the caterpillar, breaks down into the core building blocks of life, which are called amino acids. Amino acids um, together make proteins. And so in 
inside the cocoon, we get a kind of primordial soup of potential. And then over a period of a few days or a few weeks, in an astonishing flurry of creativity, these tiny building blocks reassemble into different proteins, which come together in a completely different way and create the cells of what looked like an entirely new creature. And then the butterfly is born. And I wonder whether or not that is akin to what it will be like when Jesus returns and inaugurates the new creation. Those perfect building blocks of life, which God created in the very beginning, will become part of that new and everlasting home for all who believe in Jesus. And it's going to look very different to the world around us now, because the new creation is only going to contain that which is of God. Only what he has created, not the things that have emerged because of the consequences of human sin. Over the course of this term, we've mentioned a few times that what will happen when Jesus returns is that he will get rid of, he will destroy everything that is not love. And I really believe that to be the case. I'm really hoping that will be the case. Love will be those building blocks of the new creation. And so what will flow from that is life and beauty and joy. Death and pain and sorrow will have no place in the new creation. Communities who have experienced a great earthquake have to make a choice about what is rebuilt and how to rebuild it. And that might be another way to think about the new creation. When Jesus returns, so much of what we see around us will be destroyed. And then it will be rebuilt and remade completely differently. These kind of ponderings might be leaving us with a lot of questions, not least because the Bible shows us that the new creation dawned on that first Easter morning. But clearly, we are not yet living in a world that has been built only from love. And the Bible also tells us that when we put our faith in Jesus, we become new creations. It says the old is gone and the new has come. And yet we still sin. The old ways still have some power over us. If we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then we can have confidence that the battle has been won and the new creation will one day be fully inaugurated. And then as that conviction grows in us over lots and lots of years, we will begin to notice the signs of the new creation all around us now. The new creation is found wherever God is at work through the power of his spirit. And God is always in the business of creating life, transforming what seems to be dark and like death and bringing forth from it beauty and joy and hope. And so the awe and wonder that we experience within us when a baby is born or when new life hatches out of an egg gives us just a tiny glimpse of what is going on when God is at work bringing forth new life in his world. When things happen that can't be explained any other way, when lives which appear to be broken beyond hope gradually turn around, when unjust structures in the world are challenged and when evil leaders are overthrown, these are the things that lift our hearts and cause us to rejoice and bring us hope. And the reason they do that is because they're evidence that God is still at work in his creation. He's renewing it. He is resurrecting it. And often these signs of resurrection life are largely hidden and they're certainly not widely celebrated by the world. But despite that, they are world shaking. 
like the ground tremors in the days before a huge earthquake, these signs of new life are the pattern of what will one day come in all its fullness. And then on that final day, Jesus will return in a ground splitting eruption of love and resurrection life will fully remake the universe. The message of Easter is that love wins. Life, not death, will reign forever. And Jesus is the foretaste of that. And Christians, well, we're resurrection people. We're new creations. We're those who have grasped that there is a different way to being human than the way that leads to death and destruction. Christians look to Jesus and they do the things that he did. And as they do that, through the power of God's spirit at work in the world, new life starts to break in and love begins to remake the world. And the amazing news of Easter is that we get to be part of that. We can experience it for ourselves, the remaking of our own hearts and lives. And we can be part of how others experience it too, as God's spirit is channeled through us. So let's not sleep through the earthquake. Let's not live as if the resurrection hasn't happened or hasn't made any difference. It has happened. It has made a difference. And because of Jesus, the world has changed. All we're invited to do is to put our faith and trust in him and to hold on to the hope that the new creation is on its way. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.